morning, everyone. Good happy morning. Good Neighbor Day. Good morning. Good. good morning. Happy, good, happy Good Neighbor Day. A national day of reflection, a day to renew our social contract, and to remember what it means to be, be a good neighbor. I hope you find time today to reach out to loved one, our neighbor, especially an older adult living alone, to simply say hello, to remember it's the little things that can make a difference in the lives of others. I'm Sandra Harris, the state president of AARP Massachusetts and co-chair of the Massachusetts Task Force to End Loneliness and Build Community, a coalition of oh, more than 40 plus partner organizations throughout Massachusetts with the mission of ensuring that all residents enjoy a sense of social well-being and feel connected to the community. Welcome to our third annual summit, where we will share the work we do and the work we're planning to do as we shift beyond the pandemic to address the loneliness epidemic and to promote opportunities that foster social connections in our community. We thank you for being here and we encourage you to engage with, with us throughout this program through the chat function. You can start by letting us know who you are and from where you are joining us. If you are on Twitter, please use hashtag in LonelinessMA.com. It is now my honor to present a true friend, a fierce advocate for older adults throughout the Commonwealth, the chair of the Massachusetts Joint Committee on Elder Affairs, Senator Patricia Jalen. Welcome, Senator Jalen. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. Thanks to you and Caitlin Coyle for co-chairing the task force. And most important, thanks to everybody here who's committed to the goals of the task force to end loneliness and build community. So happy Good Neighbor Day. Welcome to today's event. And I look forward to learning so much more. You've already taught me a lot. Thanks to your understanding of an important tip for lobbying, which I will make explicit. If you want a legislator to understand your issue, invite them to speak. We have to get ready. And so we have to read your reports and think about your concerns. And so I actually read your reports and I thought a lot in the past few days about the kinds of solutions to loneliness and lack of community that you're working on. As everybody acknowledges, the pandemic has ripped apart many social connections, exacerbated loneliness, and made everyone much more aware of the prevalence of isolation and loneliness, especially among older people. But we also know we've developed new tools to fight the problem. The fact that we, we're here today together means that distance and disease don't have to mean we can't get together at least virtually. So I wanna commend you all for all your work. I've thought in the past two days even more about a woman in my own neighborhood who died alone and was only found when the postal carrier found uh, uh, their mail piling up and sent for a wellness check, even though she'd also had a visit from our Council on Aging. And I wanna to stop to notice how many examples in the report involved councils on aging and how important they are in building community. Just, if you wanna raise your hands, how many people are here from councils on aging? I, you, I won't be able to see them the way, maybe I won't. Yeah, there they are. Okay, um, thank you. But I've also thought about ex other little examples of little things, little things in my own experience that have made a difference. And one's from my fa father and his church. Churches for a lot of people are a main source of community. And you probably know of examples too. And maybe we'll have you raise your hand if you um, are part of, or uh, in some way, a church that brings people together. Looking, I can't, I can't actually, there's too many people here. I can't see all the hands. Um, but uh, many churches have some sort of recognition of coming of age around junior high school. And my father's church asked every young person to choose an older person 
and interview them about their life. And I still have the life of Paul that one young person wrote about my father. This is not just a powerful way to create connection. It's also an important way to teach kids that history is not just a set of events with the names of great men and dates to memorize. It's that our lives are shaped by events and that we shape history. If I were still teaching history, I'd include an assignment like that. And I think it would really help students understand history and their own role and responsibility. And it would help older people uh, continue their legacy. Uh, so another example is recent. At the beginning of the pandemic, people formed mutual aid groups. In, in my district, it was called MAMAS, Mutual Aid of, mutual, of Medford and Somerville. Their motto was, everyone has something to offer and everyone has things they need. So it wasn't uh, service, it was more mutual aid. And those groups found and connected those needs and abilities. And one of my friends developed a friendship with a woman he, developed, he delivered groceries to that he had never known before. People set up community fridges where people still bring and receive foods, food and other supplies. And some people had urgent needs for funds for rent or food and other people contributed without asking for documentation or explanation or paperwork. There were lots more solutions, both new and old, and I hope these continue and spread even without the urgency of those early days. So I'm very excited about your work. I've learned from it and hope we can find ways to work together. I'll just mention one more community that has emerged during the pandemic. AARP and many other groups represented here have joined in Dignity Alliance and are working together to bring public and government attention to the historically mostly ignored importance of older people's real needs and also their real ability to contribute. I'll say our real ability to contribute. One of our, their focuses is on improving care in nursing homes, especially in reducing isolation and treating individuals as people and building community. Just in the past two days, I've seen dignity leaders quoted in news stories. Um, I hope many of you here, and you might raise your hands again if you can, uh, are uh, in groups that are part of Dignity. If not, I encourage you to look into that. Again, thank you so much for your work. I look forward to working together and to be sure to consider the uh, Legislature's Committee on Elder Affairs and me and my co-chair who it currently <clears throat> It's Tom Stanley from the House of Representatives. As a, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for getting together. Thank you so much, um, Senator, for your kind remarks and for all you do to ensure that the Commonwealth is a great place to live, to grow, and to age well. Thank you. I'm confident that today's keynote speaker will leave us all dreaming and scheming. The founder and co-CEO of Encore.org Mark Freeman is the author of five books, including most recently, How to Live Forever, The Enduring Power of Connecting the Generations, which was selected by the Wall Street Journal as number one on its list of the best books on aging well. Mark co-founded Experience Corps to mobilize people over 50 to improve the prospects of low-income elementary schools and the Purpose Prize, an annual award for social innovators in the second half of life. Both Experience Corps and the Purpose Prize are now programs of AARP. Mark was named a Social Entrepreneur of the Year by the World Economic Forum and has been honored with a Skull Award for Social Entrepreneurship. A formal visiting fellow at Stanford University King's College in London and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation he holds an MBA from Yale University. Mark lives with his wife and three children in the San Francisco Bay Area. Friends, it is now my honor to present a person I have come to know, not only as a good man, but a good wizard, Mark Freeman. Welcome, Mark. 
Thanks so much, Sandra. It's such an honor to be here today. And I am so grateful uh, for you inviting me and, and to AARP Massachusetts for all its work uh, to end loneliness and, and to provide purpose for people in the second half of life. And I'm, I'm so happy to follow Senator Jalen and her points uh, about the importance of intergenerational connection, uh, of mutual aid and the mutuality that follows from those kinds of connections. Um, and I thought I'd just start first with uh, a personal story, which is about my own grandmother. Before the Surgeon General had declared loneliness to be one of the biggest public health epidemics in America, before we even talked about social isolation very much, I remember visiting my grandmother who was in her 70s, had worked her entire life. Uh, my grandfather had passed away. She'd retired from her job. And I, I'd see her, she'd be alone in her small apartment. And one of the indelible memories is, is the television always being on, um, not because there was good television on. This was the era of uh, bad daytime soap operas and reruns of Gilligan's Island, but it was a voice. Um, and she was in an utterly despairing state. And uh, it was only out of desperation that she joined the retired and senior volunteer program, RSVP, uh, now part of AmeriCorps Seniors, and it, it transformed her life. She met a whole cadre of peers. Um, they became her mutual aid society uh, as, she grew older and, and um, if it wasn't for that group of people, I don't think she would have, would have uh, survived for much longer. Um, and so for me, this, this subject is, is personal. And I think these memories of my grandmother's situation has informed and infused every step of my own uh, work over the last 35 years on these issues of involving older people in the community. And I, I wanna focus particularly today on the power of intergenerational connections, again, echoing what Senator, Senator Jalen said, as both a bulwark against loneliness and a route to personal renewal and a, a more fulfilling life. Um, that, that sense of community that the Senator also talked about. And uh, to do that though, I, I wanted to talk about the predicament that we're in right now. Um, and uh, I thought I'd go back and talk about TV again. And, and that's gonna be a recurring theme throughout my remarks today, in part, because I watched too much TV like everybody else <laughs> over the last few years during uh, our enforced isolation. Um, but also because I think that we're seeing on that small screen um, uh, a reflection of both what ails us, but what uh, could heal us as well. And so I'll start with um, uh, a scene from the Kaminsky Method. I'm sure many of you watched that series on Netflix. It won many Emmys uh, in, in its uh, two seasons. But there's one scene that particularly stands out for me. Uh, the Michael Douglas character is uh, at an absolutely despairing point in his life. He's feeling isolated. Uh, he's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. He's in financial difficulties. And he's uh, wandering through a park in Los Angeles, talking to his daughter, uh, telling her his woes. And off in the distance, he hears the sound of children's voices. And he navigates his way to this playground and sits down on a bench and he's watching these kids on a, on a uh, play structure and his mood brightens and you can tell the whole tone of his voice changes. And meanwhile, at the same time in the background, you see this mother and then she's joined by another mother and then a third and they're talking in you know, concerned tones to each other. And then they're joined by a police officer and Michael Douglas is narrating this and he's saying, I can't believe it, they've called the cops. And, th and that is uh, a depiction of the predicament we're in, an age apartheid America where when the generations <laughs> are drawn together, it becomes uh, something that people call the cops uh, about. And so 
I think the question it raises for me is how things got this way. And I um, uh, I know Senator Jalen taught history. I, I uh, wanted to go to grad school in history. I was a history major in college. And, and so I went rummaging through our past to try to see, is, you know, is this normal? Is this the way things have always been? And discovered quite the opposite. We began the 20th century in the United States as one of the most age integrated societies in the world. In fact, in in 19th century America, people didn't even know how old they were. It would be like knowing somebody's blood type today. Um, and every dimension of society and of daily life was integrated by age. It was an agrarian society. Older and younger people work side by side in the fields. Uh, Multi-generational housing was the norm. Even those one room schoolhouses of your had four year olds and 45 year olds learning the alphabet side by side. And so we, we began uh, the, the past century in a very different place. And then um, we decided to reorganize life by age. And it was not a nefarious plot. In fact, in many ways, it was the result of some of the most important progressive reforms of the last century. Child labor laws and universal schooling led young people to be uh, shunted in the direction of, of settings with and exclusively with other young people. Social security, which is what my grandmother survived on and I think is the great policy triumph of the uh, last century, did have as an intended goal getting older people out of the workforce. It was, we were in, mired in the depression, youth unemployment was close to 20%. We wanted to provide an incentive uh, and security for older people to leave the workforce. And then one after another, we invented institutions which put older people almost entirely with other older people, nursing homes, senior centers, retirement communities. Um, and soon the generational twains stopped meeting. And the, the turning point in this historic shift, uh, you can actually put a particular pin in the year 1956. L Lewis Mumford, who was one of our greatest social observers in the past century. He was the architecture critic for The New Yorker. In 1956, wrote a cover story for the magazine Architecture Digest. And in it, he said that we'd added years to life, but we added them to the wrong end of life. He said that no group in history has ever been so isolated, so rejected, um, so maligned as older people today. And he had just turned 60 himself and there was a, a personal tinge to it. And um, Mumford wasn't there to, to complain. He was there to propose solutions. And he said, we've got to fix this. Um, and he had two prescriptions because the problems he was trying to solve were isolation and loneliness on one side and a lack of identity and purpose on the other. And he said, first of all, we have to resist infantilizing older people and turning later life into a second childhood. And second, and most importantly, we had to integrate older people fully into the life of all generations. In fact, the, the title of the article was called For Older People, Not Segregation, Integration. And that very same year, 1956, was the year that big Ben Schleifer, a housing entrepreneur uh, outside of Phoenix, put the finishing touches on a community which was designed to solve exactly the same problems that Lewis Mumford was railing about. In fact, uh, big Ben Schleifer, who was from New York, was inspired to start this community by visiting an older friend in New York State who was languishing in a nursing home, cut off, utterly isolated. So he decided he would create a community um, that uh, was exclusively for older people and focused on the idea of graying as playing. Uh, it was called Young Town. <laughs> so that so much for uh, Lewis Mumford's first uh, challenge. Um, and it was exclusively for people over the age of 55. Um, I don't have to tell you which vision captured the imagination of the 20th century. Uh, Youngtown was featured on the Today Show at the time, Dave Garraway's show, Watched by Millions of People. Um, a few years later, Del Webb across the street from Youngtown opened up Sun City on the first day of 
Sun City, 100,000 people showed up. There was a traffic jam for 20 miles of older people trying to uh, embrace a life that was focused on play and segregated by age. And we ended the 20th century. Remember, we started it the most age integrated society in the world, but we ended it as the most age segregated. Andrew Scott of London Business School describes uh, America today as being in a stage of age apartheid. So uh, what we created is something that met the needs in many ways of older people of the day, but leaves us ill prepared for the future. First of all, it runs against the grain of everything we know about human thriving. You know, now evolutionary anthropologists believe that the reason we became human beings in the first place is the role older people played in caring for children. In the hunter-gatherer societies that were the first human societies, grandmothers took care of young children while both parents went off and hunted and gathered, and that allowed us uh, to grow those big brains that human babies have, and, and you know, the rest is, is uh, evolutionary history. I got interested in this field uh, from the perspective of human development, not human development of older people, but of younger ones. I was interested in the power of mentoring to help support young people and uh, was involved in the first study of Big Brothers Big Sisters, which showed that mentors made an important difference in the lives of kids. Um, and I remember even during that period, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who was a developmental psychologist at Cornell and who founded the Head Start program being asked towards the end of his life what he had learned about what young people need. And he said, what every child needs is at least one adult who's irrationally crazy about them. And what I've learned uh, since that time, uh, not only through reading and research, but personally as I, uh, I'm 64 years old today, is that we older people need to be irrationally crazy about young people every bit as much as they need that from us. Laura Carstensen from the Stanford Center on Longevity has found that as we grow older, that we become more and more focused on the importance of relationship. She has a theory called socio-emotional selectivity, but if you boil it down to a, the common sense insight, it's that as we realize there's less time left in life, it draws us to focus more and more on connection and bonds, which is why the isolation and loneliness issue runs so much against the grain of what we need as we grow older. Um, it, and when you think about it, if, if somebody tells you that you've got a month left to live, you don't decide to go out and learn a new language or focus on you know, taking up an instrument. You focus on the people you love, on connecting with them. And what Carstensen and others have found is not just that relationship and connection become of primary importance as we grow older, but we get better at it. Emotional regulation, empathy, a whole set of skills that are needed to form and maintain relationships blossom in later life. Our, our knees may creak and our eyesight might not be as acute, but our relationship skills are, are better than they've ever been. And, we now know also from the Harvard study of adult development that uh, these relationships are not only important, but there's a direction to this impulse to connection. Um, the this Harvard study found that older people who connect with younger ones, who mentor, who support younger generations are three times as likely to be happy as those who fail to do do so three times as likely. You know, there's a best-selling book, 10% Happier. Well, this is 300% more likely to be happier. And, and George Valent, the uh, great Harvard psychiatrist who led that study for 40 years, says it's not by happenstance. It's, it's deeply rooted in the human experience. He, he says biology flows downhill. So we've created this house divided against itself, uh, a society that's organized in ways that are at odds with what we know from human evolution, from human development, from human thriving. How can you know how to be a, a graceful older person 
when you have very little contact with older people as a young person? How can we learn how to be a, a successful multi-generational society when the generations have so little opportunity to connect? It's essentially a grievous wound that we've inflicted on ourselves. Um, is it any surprise under these circumstances that we hear about generational jousting, uh, okay boomer versus okay millennial? Um, is it any surprise that ageism continues to rear its head? Any surprise that isolation and loneliness are at the epidemic proportions that we see today with older and younger people being two of the most isolated groups in society. And if that's a problem, um, it's gonna be even worse under the new demographic reality. New research from Stanford uh, in, contained in the New Map of Life report shows that America today is the most age diverse society in human history. They, show two charts, one from 1900, that period when we were highly age integrated, birth to 74, the number of people in society, and it's a straight downhill slope from birth to 74. The same chart for 2020 is a flat line. They're the same number of people who were 36 and 12 and 57 and 72. Um, we have 25% of the population under 20, 23% of the population over 60, and 52% of the population in between. Again, the house divided against itself, the most age diverse society in human history, and one of the most age segregated. So just to invoke Lewis Mumford yet again, we've got to fix this, and we've got to fix this now. But I, I've got some good news, which is that that is happening and in multiple ways at multiple levels in ways that give me great hope for our ability to forge stronger generational connections in ways that not only solve the loneliness problem, but, uh, but create its opposite, which is a society with much deeper connection. And I'll tell a story from David Brooks, the New York Times columnist. I don't know if he's ever written about this, but I heard him give a speech and he talked about a, uh, a guy in Southern California, I'm in Los Angeles today giving, giving this talk, who buys a house and it's got a bamboo grove and he hates bamboo. So he gets out his ax and he chops down all the bamboo, but he's still worried about the bamboo. So he goes to hardware store and buys a bunch of bamboo poison and pours it over the uh, the bamboo stumps um still not happy so he calls up a contractor has the guy come in and he paves over the bamboo grove and a year later the bamboo is breaking through the sidewalk and i think that's what's happening today you know we've what we've done over the last 7500 years runs so counter to how we've lived as, as humans since the beginning of history, uh, it's an anomaly. And I think that what we're seeing is, is human resilience in action. And we're seeing it at so many different levels. Um, I think we're seeing a, a, a zeitgeist shift today. You know, I started out um, talking about TV and I have to go back to TV because the Emmys were two weeks ago and Hacks won for, uh, uh, Jean Smart as the best actress in a comedy series following a bunch of Emmy awards the previous year. And Hacks, for those of you who haven't seen it, is the story of a 25-year-old comedy writer and a 70-year-old comedian who's kind of in the, in the uh, model of Joan Rivers, who are, are both canceled. The 70-year-old comedian's Las Vegas show, Long Running, is, is canceled. The 25-year-old comedy writer is uh, canceled uh, figuratively for an indiscreet tweet. They have the same agent. They're thrown together. And uh, despite uh, a lot of uh, uh, misgivings on both parts, uh, learn to work together and essentially save each other's careers and in many ways save each other in, in deeper ways as well. Only Murders of the Building with Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez was also up for a, a bevy of Emmys. Even Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga, 60 years apart, uh, having just won a Grammy for their 
new album uh, were nom where they were nominated for an Emmy for their for their video. So this some of these uh, uh, um, new visions of of people coming together across age are not just in the air, it's on the air and it's also on the ground. The Pew Research Center reports that there's been a fourfold increase in multi-generational housing in America. 60 million Americans are living in three or four or more generation households. Um, that's something that we haven't seen since the 1940s. And we at Encore just did a study with the National Opinion Research Center at University of Chicago. And we asked older and younger people not only did they want to come together to connect, but did they want to come together to collaborate and collaborate on solving some of the biggest problems of the day? And the answer was a resounding yes. Uh, there was deep pent up demand in both generations. And we asked people what they were interested in working on. And older people were most interested in working on climate and the environment. Uh, younger people were most interested in working on mental health. And there was deep interest in both groups also on working together on education. And you could see the outlines of a coalition for the future uh, led by older and, and younger people around issues like education and the environment and connection and mental health and fighting loneliness. Uh, one of the most encouraging findings from this research is that the strongest interest of all was from young people, from Gen Z, and from people of color of all ages, particularly young people of color, who you can almost hear them through the pages of this report calling on us older people um, and saying, uh, we need you. Uh, first of all, you can't create these problems and then pat us on the back and tell us to go solve them. But just as much as we can't solve them ourselves, uh, this isn't the kind of stuff that any one generation can tackle. And we, we want to work together with you to, to take on the most pressing issues of the day. Um, I, I think one of the uh, most encouraging developments uh, for me is, is a rise in social innovation. I talked before about the institutions that we've created that separate older people from society, you know, nursing homes, sen senior centers, retirement communities, those are not natural phenomena. They were invented by entrepreneurs, by innovators, by people with enormous creativity who are solving the problem of the day. I think we need to do the same now, but in ways that are as creative in bringing people together across age as we've been in splitting them apart. And I see it happening everywhere. Massachusetts has been an absolute hotbed, one of my favorite initiatives. Uh, Nestor Lee was recently featured on the PBS NewsHour and the Today Show, providing shared housing uh, for older and younger people. Um, and I think housing, just as it led the way in separating us, going back to Big Ben Schlafer in Youngtown and Del Webb, um, and is still in many ways uh, doing that. The census came out last year and the villages, the community in Florida that has been um, uh, a bastion of age segregation and right-wing politics is the fastest growing community in America, uh, bar none. Uh, not just the fastest growing retirement community, the fastest growing metropolitan area in America. So I don't wanna suggest that any of this is gonna happen easily or at automatically, but I think we've gotta solve three problems, a failure of imagination, the way we think about generational relations. We've been separated and segregated for so long that in many ways we've forgotten how to, to work together. Uh, and that's why I think this, these instances of popular culture, which include even the game show, The Generation Gap. I don't know how many of you have seen The Generation Gap, but it's not about the generation gap. It's about grandparents and grandchildren working together. They're fighting and competing against other grandparents or, or grandchildren. And as I, I was starting to say, we, we're going to need to be as creative um, as we can be to solve this failure of innovation. And so that's why efforts like Nesterly are so important. I'll, I'll describe another housing example that I encountered in Cleveland. I went to see an old mentor of mine who had moved into 
Judson Manor, which is strategically poised in Cleveland between all of the major arts institutions of the city, Severance Hall, where the orchestra plays and the art museums. And on the other side is the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and the, the residents of Judson Manor, the art lovers that they are, decided to provide free housing in the community for students at the local uh, conservatory of music and art institute and i showed up to see what was happening there and there were 30 swedish and danish social scientists awaiting me in the lobby who had come all the way from scandinavia to to see what they could learn from judson manor and you know when the scandinavians are coming to america and this was in the middle of winter uh to get ideas for enlightened social policy, you're, you're on to something. And what I discovered there is that they, they hadn't wasted their money. It, they, uh, kinds of connections that were being forged were deeply moving. I met a woman named Carla who was in her 90s who had lived next to a young violist who was at the conservatory. Uh, she married a, another young violist. And when they planned their wedding, they didn't invite Carla. They asked her to be the maid of honor. So that uh, is the result of, I think, two really important principles, which is proximity and purpose. And I think we're, we're not just going to have to be, we're not only going to have to be creative, we're going to have to be creative at scale. And there are many lessons from a, abroad uh, on that idea. One of my favorite is Singapore, which has invested $3 billion into creating what they've described as a compound for all ages, with compound being the Malay word for village. So if we, if we can solve the problem of imagination, the problem of innovation, and as Singapore is doing the problem of investment, I think we really can fix this. And I think we can create a society that works better, that has greater social cohesion, comprised of people who have a sense of the wholeness of life as we're living these much longer lives. And I think we can do something even more important, uh, deeper, that is uh, the core of what we're gathered today to focus on, to create a society that has more connection, that has more affection. And I'll just go out and say it, a society that has more love. And I feel like I can get away with saying that because Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, has been talking about love as the opposite of loneliness and how important it it is. And I'll, I'll go back to hacks and close by talking about TV since I can't seem to stop doing so. But the New York Times described hacks as a love story disguised as a hate story. And, you know, I, I hope if we can fix this, that that will be um, the watchword for our age diverse future, a love story <laughs> disguised as a hate story. Um, and I think we could do something uh, unusual, but utterly important, which is to create a case of life imitating art. And I can think of no better benediction for this multi-generational moment that's already sweeping over us and that will define our future. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. It was really, really great to hear from you. Um, there's been a lot of nice discourse and back and forth happening in the chat. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so now, you know, we have a lot of work to do as a society to make the most of this multi-generational moment, uh, but also a lot to celebrate and be proud of. Um, as Mark said, you know, some of these these things are already happening. And before we go on, I think we should take a moment to be proud of ourselves. Everybody here in this room today at the watch parties across the city, we've all committed in some way to breaking down these silos and building age-friendly, diverse, inclusive communities. So today is Good Neighbors Day. It's a day of celebration. And I hope when this summit concludes, everyone here in this room and at the watch parties, um, they leave with new people in your networks, ideas to follow up on, plans to collaborate with each other in more ways than ever before. And so in the next, oh, we have a little bit of extra time, so th that's great, more time to, to chit chat. Um, so in the next few minutes here, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, 
some reflections on, on the chat and to reflect on Mark's words and the, what he shared with us today. Um, so to start, does anyone want to share in the chat um, some evidence of the imagination? Mark said one of the things is that we're lacking imagination. Um, so what innovation or Im imaginative solutions have you seen in your own communities that have brought generations together and have broken down these silos and started uh, bringing our multicultural community back together again? Give people a couple minutes to think that was a lot. So Caitlin asked, what are the biggest challenges of forging intergenerational experiences? I could jump in and, and add a thought in response to Caitlin's points. That, that report that I cited earlier with, uh, the, with National Opinion Research Center at University of Chicago asked that question of what are the biggest barriers um, for connection and collaboration between the generations. And what older and younger people said converged. And it was two things. Uh, one, um, the lack of proximity. It's, it's hard to do. You, you have to, it takes an almost entrepreneurial heroic effort in many cases to, to come together across generations. And then there was an underlying worry that we don't even know how to talk to each other, that there's not enough practice and particularly beyond families and into communities. And so I think th those are two issues that, uh, that older and and younger people are both identifying as, as areas where we, where we need to make progress. Great, thank you. And I'm seeing, a, now that people have had a minute to think about it, we have a lot of activity in the chat. Uh, Caitlin said, political activism, seeing folks standing out together. Um, you know, that's, that's really exciting to see. Um, in, you know, in one way we've been you know, standing for the same things for generations, which doesn't feel great. Um, but at the other time, there's a real learning opportunity and moment for to, to pass the torch or share the torch um, in political activism. Joanne and Duxbury uh, mentioned that they have a day where seniors spend the day with seniors at school um, and older alert, adults learn what it's like in school today and students gain words of wisdom from students. Um, James mentioned the age and dementia friendly communities are innovating all the time to bring people together. Barbara on the Cape, um, the Yarmouth Senior Center hosted a conference with the high school students. Um, Casley mentioned neighborhood block parties. That's something when I was a kid, the block parties, I lived in a pretty rural neighborhood. Block parties were a really big part of the summer. Um, and I know that I live in Boston now and the city has been starting to do the open streets and the block parties. And those have been really fun uh, post pandemic, bringing neighbors together again. Um, we have Gail who said that she's befriending older neighbors and hosting tea on a one-on-one -on -one level. Um, there, there's so much more campfire, sing-alongs, conversations, um air well the chat is moving so fast i can't keep up intergenerational bicycle uh bike event ride in in worcester um lbfv this is my colleague of mine uh connected college students to older adults uh and Stephen, at uh the last what i can see here is um while the pandemic knocked us back adoption of virtual gatherings is invaluable long term um Video games, interesting opportunity. That's an, um, I worked with a group of students recently and one of the proposals that they had for an intergenerational opportunity would be to video game together. Uh, so there could be some more connection between grandkids and grandparents, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, so um, And Holly said the, the perception that all older adults are interested in having young children sing to them or come to do crafts with them is in, 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 that's a hard word for me but that's a really good point holly that uh, thinking about the the innovative projects and the opportunities that we create as a community is something that we we all do together and having you know starting in a place of equity and dignity and understanding so more more opportunities um, of different different caliber 
Um, so that's great. And just keep things coming in the chat and we will be able to share the chat later too and some of the the interesting ideas. I don't want to um, take my the entire time here uh, reading them aloud, but I do encourage when the chats come out to take a look because there's a lot of really cool, interesting things happening, you know, across the Commonwealth and across the country. That's really, as Mark says, meeting that multi-generational moment. Um, so in the last 10 or so minutes I have with you now, um, one of the goals of this task force is to facilitate collaboration between individuals, communities, organizations. Um, and it's one of the ways that will turn around age, age segregation and tear down these generational silos. So while we have a minute and we're all here together, I'd love to use the chat function again um, to make introductions. So what I'd like to see, and again, we'll share this out, is if you can write your name, your location, an email, and a sentence to open up for collaboration. And we'll share this uh, again with the group um, in, you know, if we were in person together today, you might take the break to, to network with each other and share business cards. So this is kind of the, the business cards section of our summit today. Um, so for example, I might say, my name is Nikki Schultz. I'm in Boston and I'm looking to collaborate with higher ed institutions for intergenerational programs. So after the summit, when you're really jazzed and really motivated, inspired by all we heard today, you might look at this list and be like, oh, I remember Nikki from Boston. Yes, I'm going to send her an email now because I have this, I work at this college, this university, and I, I've been looking for this opportunity. Um, so go ahead in the chat, who you are, where you are. Um, sometimes geography doesn't even matter anymore, but nice to know where people are coming from. Um, I see Bev, uh, she's created an app for gathering support using video messages. Um, and just keep them coming in the chat. Jean, I, thank you. Nikki, can I add something? Um, Absolutely. I'm, in, I'm interested in knowing, I, I know a lot of folks are here related to their work, but um, I, no, I noticed several people are not. I'm kind of interested in hearing from the people that are like myself, that are just individuals that are looking for ways to connect, um, kind of why they came here. My um, Social life was never lacking until I went to remote work. So I'm still working full time, I'm working remotely and I'm finding I really need to be creative in finding connections. Um, so I, I'd be interested in you know, hearing from other folks like me what they've kind of come up with to help them generate some social connection. Colleen, that's an excellent point, and I um, I'm willing to to wager that you are not the only person on this call that uh, has the the same feelings about remote work and you know having to be more intentional and proactive about building your your social life. Um, so absolutely, also add in the chat um, on a personal level who you are, what you're looking for. Someone earlier mentioned that she's been hosting teas. So if you're someone that's looking for someone to go out for tea, that might be uh, an opportunity as well. Again, anything that you would share a business card or a phone number for, this is your moment. We have Amy and Newton, Jean in Boston, Barbara on the Cape, Cindy in North Andover. Really great uh, geographic diversity here today. Doug in Boston, Teresa's in Gloucester. Kathleen, Steve, thank you everyone for, for sharing and for being open for collaboration. As I mentioned, this task force, we are we are nothing if not collaborators. We're we're growing. Every meeting we have new faces and new people ready to, to work together and be a part of this this moment and be a part of the, the innovation. Thank you, Holly, James, Gail. But I'll let uh, I'll let folks keep adding in the chat uh, who you are, what you're looking for. Uh, we'll get this to everyone as soon as we can. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass it back over to my colleague, Caitlin. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's here with us this morning. This is always a very exciting event for us. Happy Good Neighbor Day. 
my name is Caitlin Coyle and I am the director of the Center for Social and Demographic Research on Aging at UMass Boston Gerontology and also co-chair of the Task Force to End Loneliness and Build Community uh, with Sandra Harris. And I have the pleasure this morning of introducing a panel uh, who will be sharing their uh, ideas and experiences from programs that they've been working on in their own communities. One of the things we wanted to really make sure we do today is to give attendees a real uh, sort of tangible ideas of things that they can go back to their communities and start thinking about. Um, so I'm going to sort of introduce them all up front and then we they'll have a few minutes to speak and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So as you're listening, um, please feel free to uh, jot down, you know, questions or, or things in the chat. And when we have the opportunity to engage with the panel, uh, I'll facilitate uh, that back and forth. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Jean Bushnell, who is the director of the Bill Ricca Council on Aging in Massachusetts, as well as a member of our task force. Um, and then uh, after Jean, we'll hear from Joanne Moore, who is the senior center director in Duxbury, Mass, uh, followed by Janet Sekel Sarati, uh, director of Friendship Works, and then Michael, Mike Squindo from the Agawam Senior Center out in Western Mass, as well as um, Elaine Barless who is um, on the advisory board for JP at Home, one of the village organizations um, in, the, in the Boston area. So um, I'm, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jean, who's gonna have about five minutes to tell us about um, the great work that she's leading in Bill Ricca. Take it away, Jean. You're on mute. On okay. mute. There we go. Huh. Thanks again for having me on the panel. Uh, I was so moved by Mark's remarks, uh, you know, eliminating segregation and separation and uh, bringing love to all of us. So I'm sending love out to you all. Um, I think the point you're making, Caitlin, is that folks want to leave with some solutions, uh, practical means of how they can go back to their local community and do some stuff. And I would uh, like to um, leave with potentially three principles and hopefully uh, one might apply um, in your neighborhood or in your community. Um, the first important principle is basically you can't do this alone, that the perimeter of the problem is overwhelming and therefore at the local level, we have to engage with experience and capacity. So uh, that, that's the first principle. We can't do this alone at the local level. Um, <clears throat> Secondarily, um, as, as we, we look at this uh, principle one, um, you need to think about which community partners make sense and what types of relationships you are going to build in order to help you tackle this. Um, when I arrived at the COA in Barica, like so many other councils on aging, one of the big issues we face is being viewed as a place for old people and bingo. Uh, I was very fortunate immediately to meet the CEO of the local uh, TV station, Mark, actually Sam, who worked with me in creating a program called BCOA Up Close. And that gave us an opportunity to tell our story in a multifaceted way each month so that we are projecting positivity because folks that are down and are in a dark place they're not interested in connecting with an organization that's dark. So your first point is to manage the brand. And this is where the local TV station really, really helped us to bring out speakers, to really change the tone of the organization so it's positive. So that, that was basically the first. The second principle is positivity is key to helping people lift themselves up. So you want to project a lot of posi uh, positivity about your organization. So because of the time we uh, spent building the relationship with our local TV station over a five year period, at the drop of a hat, we would call upon them if we had something exciting going on, whether it is a performance, a show, uh, because we are broadcasting this to folks who are homebound and lonely, and we want to project positivity. So at any moment that we could get them out to tape, to, to capture something we're doing, we would absolutely do that because we, we wanna get positive information in. And 
And the third is that we got we have to lean on technological solutions and bringing the center into the homes of folks who cannot go to the center is really really important and so once again um we broadcast and bring to them everything we bring to them health programs we provide opportunities to connect etc so your local tv station is really really a hidden gem because they've got so much to offer but it wouldn't happen overnight you have to like anything else build that relationship solidify that relationship help them see what are you trying to accomplish and then they are basically at your beck and call helping you to reach out to the homebound those folks who are sad who are down projecting your center into their homes. So if, if I may capture those three critical points, the first is can't, you cannot do this alone. It, it is a large need addressing loneliness and isolation. And you have to figure out which local partners you're going to engage with to really, really help to solve stuff at a local level. Positivity is key. And therefore, as you broadcast to these folks that are homebound, you want to broadcast positive stuff so that they can connect, they can feel part of a whole that's positive. And last, you want to activate, you want to activate that relationship with your local TV station. So in summary, it's CPA. I'd like to leave you with CPA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean, that was wonderful. Um, and a nice segue into hearing from Joanne, who's going to talk with us about some of the remote programming and things that are happening in Duxbury. Sure. So I also want to follow up a little bit with what Jean was saying about PAC TV. The, our, that's our local public access as well. So I'm Joanne Moore, and I'm so pleased to be here today. Happy birthday, Mark. And thank you so much for your wonderful words of wisdom. Um, being connected and getting back in port person makes us feel so wonderful, warm. It, 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 brightens our lives and our days. Um, I'm gonna talk about two things we've done during the pandemic and beyond to help people stay connected and reduce social isolation. Um, we connect with our community partners and we're connecting with the community and how we're doing it is we're, we're really focused on, on where they are, not where we are. So the third first thing we did was expand our programming using public access TV. We partnered with three other towns in our service area Plymouth, Kingston, and Pembroke, and we created a standardized TV guide that was posted in each of our newsletters and added programs with many instructors that were already at our senior centers. We taught fitness classes seven days a week, two times a day. And every Monday we offered musical Mondays. We split the cost of entertainers so participants had something to look for every week. We even had the singing trooper come on New Year's Eve with a grab and go dinner. And I have to say those grab and go dinners are another very successful way to connect with people um, during the pandemic and beyond. And thanks to Max Mass Access, we were able to add to our programming. Um, so this, the schedule was ongoing and fresh. Um, so the other thing we did was we met where people are. Um, we pivoted our program, um, our in-person programs to a Zoom format. Um, we were so fortunate in Duxbury, we had just completed a construction project. So we had nine classrooms that were outfitted with smart TVs. So this enabled us to more easily, I'm not gonna say it was easy, to transition to a virtual platform. On March 13th, we purchased seven Zoom licenses and learned how to Zoom, learn, learned how to use Zoom over the weekend. I'm so thankful I have a young adult person in my family who taught me the ins and outs because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, that following week, we purchased 18 more licenses and hard to believe the senior center was the leader in the town using technology at that time. In the early months of COVID, our instructors and students were all at home. We had four fitness instructors who were offered uh, free classes on Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, we created Zoom classrooms at the Senior Center so instructors could come and teach classes on Zoom while our participants were at home. 
and those without technologies came to see the senior center and we formed small groups so they could have the virtual classes, but in a small and safe way. And those classes continue today. Today, we offer virtual classes with many options. Our instructors and students are all on Zoom. Our instructors are at home and our students are on site. Our instructors are on site and our students are at home. And we've even taught cooking classes where students or our, our adults, our students, are picking up supplies and they join either PAC TV or our Zoom um, cl classes and they cook a class at home and the instructor is on Zoom and then they share that meal with a friend, just another way to connect where people are comfortable. I'm happy, so happy that we're back in person, but the virtual program, there's so many benefits. In fact, in FY 2022, 29% of people participated in our programs via Zoom. Um, people have said technology training has made me confident in my ability to get on Zoom. I feel safe coming together in small groups to attend. I use Schedules Plus, that's our software package, to access the Zoom links. As a caregiver, I'm able to attend without leaving my loved one at home alone. The Zoom option allows me to exercise safely. I have hearing issues. I can turn up the volume as loud as I need and get a private yoga class twice a week. And since the restrictions have loosened up and traveling and people are traveling more and more, people say, I can still join in on Zoom. And I even have my friends and family join in. And for us, the staff at the Senior Center, we've extended our reach. We've had people attend from all across the country, as far away as Ireland, England, France, Canada, and Costa Rica. And we've been able to attract facilitators and instructors from all over the country. We have two lifelong learning instructors. One lives in Maine and one lives in California. And I love hearing, I took a class the other day with my sister and she lives in Ohio. So the, the pandemic was long, hard, but it was filled with creativity and learning. For us, the virtual programming is here to stay. It has provided us with lots of opportunities to connect, connect with people in new ways and comfortable where, where they are. So we're so happy that we have that option to connect with people in this other format. Of course, we love connecting most in person, but if you can't be here, that's the next best thing. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Janet. Who's on mute still, Janet. Technology, there we go. <laughs> so I, I'm Janet Cycle Serrati and the Director of Friendship Works. And some of you may not know us, we're not as uh, popular as uh, Councils on Aging. So I'll just tell you a little bit about um, who we are. We're a nonprofit uh, whose mission for the last 39 years has been to reduce social isolation, improve quality of life, and maintain the dignity of elders. And our enduring vision is to end elder isolation and create connection. We were actually built, it speaks to some of the things that both Jean and Joanne and Mark spoke about, but we actually started out as a coalition, a collaboration of congregations, health and human services, and funded by a medical uh, foundation, Robert Johnson Foundation, that recognized that people living alone, and this was in the early 80s and late 70s, weren't faring as well when family and friends weren't around, and wanted to see if volunteers could make some of that difference, um, fill some of those needs. And um, our, our work is mostly done by volunteers, and I don't even like to call it work. It's really about neighbor to neighbor. It's about becoming friends. It's about what Mark spoke about, bringing people together who don't know how multi-generation, sometimes it's same generation, sometimes it's different generations, but anybody 18 up to 100, you know, have been our volunteers. Um, it's free all to older adults who receive the service because that's what friendship is about. It's a gift from the heart and it's mutual. It goes both ways and it's very personalized. So I was asked to speak about, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we have and how we've overcome it. But first, I'll just let you know, we do a lot of friendly visiting um, and medical escorts, as well as bringing um, music and pets and support to folks. So um, I'm going to focus on our medical escort um, and uh, and talk about that almost 
and right before that, just saying the importance of proximity, I think is so important, getting volunteers connecting and also being in person in this time of technology where we know how important that is that actually during COVID and even before that, that touch deprivation has been one of the reasons for depression and even like with young infants, um, a source of death for, for older adults. There have been articles on that. So a lot of people aren't getting to medical appointments um, because of COVID. Um, they, they, weren't, they were afraid to, there was a lot more um, requirements of the healthcare system in terms of having an escort you know, on your way home. People don't have somebody to go home with them. Um, people have mobility and vision impairments, and there's also emotional reasons. And people still after COVID are a little bit afraid of going out some for good reasons and just, and sometimes out of fear that has, that we've all developed um, during this time. It, so the anxiety can be a reason or it can be a physical reason. And to volunteer for this, getting people there is really a challenge. These are volunteers who have to be available during daytime hours, have chunks of time, not be afraid of the medical system. So it's one of our most difficult places to um, recruit volunteers for and uh, COVID made it much more difficult and now post COVID. So some of the things that we're doing is one is letting older adults know that we are here. Um, staff have taken more of a little bit more of a role. Um, we've always had that um, we're an organization that all new staff have to do two to three escorts. It's a way of orienting and understanding what um, their colleagues are doing and what we are all about. So even if their position is very different and doesn't matter if they're in development or publicity or friendly visiting coordinator, they all have to do two to three um, escorts to understand um, who we're serving and what, what this issue is. Looking at our model, I think always being adaptable. So no matter what program you're in, you know, no matter what you're doing in life, I think one thing we all learned during COVID is to be adaptable, to be flexible, and to continue to do that throughout life. Change your model, look at the model. Maybe it doesn't work for this generation. We've had to change our work many times in the last 39 years. It's been almost four decades. And um, saying this may not be the most important thing today, or maybe this is a way to recruit volunteers, or maybe there's a flexibility. We've asked for two weeks notice um, for if an escort, if somebody needs somebody to go to a medical appointment, that gives us the time to find the right person for them. Um, and the realities of you know, the environment. So we used to always go into the appointment with somebody if it was requested. Obviously during COVID, we couldn't do that, but we're going back to that. So letting people know the training, the setting the expectations of people. And then there's just being out in the community. So for those of you who do a lot in recruiting volunteers, is going to those volunteer fairs, going into the communities where you're recruiting volunteers. They're doing things online is, Definitely, we get most of our volunteers from online, but being at a fair, being at a congregation, being in the community, going to an event, just even on a weekend, being parted, not always expecting people to come to you, but for us to be out there, even if it's not really recruiting, but just to really know the community, to be part of it, to feel like you're not separate from it, I think is is really important, and that takes time, but it... it um, I think our work is so much better because we become part of that culture of that specific community as best as we can and know what the environment asks for. We've also always had internships, but looking a little bit more at that um, so that maybe the model of always one-on-one -on -one is it works to some degree, but melding that with interns who can do three or four escorts a week rather than just one, one part of it. So I think it's really about looking at and talking with and sharing and, and as I think Jean said, you can't do it alone, um, getting ideas and that no ideas off the table and thinking, well, this is 2022. What do we need to do today? And it's okay if it's not what we did yesterday. It's a way of being fresh and looking at the world anew. Um, also that um, we, you know, the doing training for people, like there are people that we may bring to a medical appointment who are blind. There are others who may be visually um, uh, visually impaired, as I said, um, or hearing impaired. So we need to be prepared 
how do we communicate and train our volunteers for that? It might be that somebody has high anxiety. It might be, um, so really that personalization, if you're doing any direct service, it's not a one size fits all, but really looking at that. And then asking somebody, you know, would you like me to hold your hand? Would you like me to take your arm? Um, just that sense of safe touch or giving a hug afterwards um, is so important. Um, asking what their need is and what their, what their, you know, where they don't want uh, that and, and always uh, feeling comfortable to, to ask. So I think my biggest takeaways is to be flexible, to be adaptable, to ask, um, to know that just like no two people are the same, two communities are not the same either and getting to know them as best you can and looking at recruitment at where you need to be and at what time in order to both let people know that your program is, exists if they want the service as well as to uh, give the opportunity for volunteers to know or anybody in the community uh, what the parameters of the program are so that they might be enticed to to want to make a difference and as all of us know that volunteers will often say they get more out of it than what they give. So remember that and not be shy. You're, you're giving an opportunity uh, to people to make a difference and to enhance their own life and to be less lonely for them as well. Thank you, Janet. Lots of good, good stuff in there. I want to uh, pass it over to Michael. Thanks, Caitlin, and thanks to the organizers of this event for having me um, with this panel today. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about our grab and go program, the curbside meal pickup here in Agawam. Um, I think many of us are familiar with the concept now, two years after the pandemic, but just for those who may not be, it's effectively it's takeout meal service um, at sites that traditionally offered only congregate and maybe home delivered meals, depending on their site. Um, and I really want to focus on the impact that we're seeing it's having in our community, because I think that that impact can be extrapolated and, and replicated elsewhere. Um, so just a quick background on how it started. First, I will give a plug for Agawam, because I think we were one of the first communities in the state and definitely, I think, the first community in our catchment area to implement the program. Um, when the governor shut us down uh, across the state, you know, my staff looked at me and they're like, we have, you know, 50 people coming to congregate every day, we can't convert that to home delivered meals. And even if we could, imagine trying to get people off of that once they've had that, that opportunity to, to taste that delivered meal right at their door. Um, so we shut down for a week as we kind of pivoted into this grab and go concept. It was rough. We weren't, um, we weren't sure what we were doing. We didn't know how to do it. Um, our funding source uh, did not have a lot of guidance to provide, so we we're kind of left on our own. Uh, but my staff persevered. They, they made it work. And now two years later, we are still operating five days a week um, in addition to congregate and home-delivered meals, our grab-and-go service. Um, and in the last 12 months, uh, which is the federal fiscal year that we operate on for the, the grant program, so that's how my stats are working. But in the last 12 months, I can tell you that uh, we've seen about uh, 340 individuals use our grab and go program. Of that, 40% of them did not attend the senior center in any other capacity throughout that 12 month period. So they didn't come for a program, they didn't come for social services, they didn't come to volunteer. Um, and so I have to dig a little deeper in that in the history of the senior center, but that that leads me to believe that this becomes a gateway opportunity to start reaching the folks that otherwise aren't coming through our doors. Um, and if we can reach them earlier and sooner and and develop that relationship, then I I'm very certain that they will know that we're here and, and be more comfortable accessing us later on when they need different services. Um, I do, I have to say that I chuckled reading the title of this summit task force that shift happens. Um, and, and I just wanna say that, that the pandemic definitely created an opportunity for us. And, and our shift went from basically the, you know, I think most of us have heard the phrase, this is what's for dinner. If you don't like it, don't eat it. And I think that what we realized during the pandemic and beyond is that we need to shift that model of thinking to be a more person-centered approach that provides choice to, I'll call them our consumers. So when we have traditional congregate and home delivered meals, 
what happens to the individual who's not by definition eligible for home delivered meals, but otherwise can't or won't come to congregate dining. And so I, I put that out there because I think that, that that created the question of how do we answer that need? And for us, it was grab and go. So once we had the opportunity to justify extending our services beyond the pandemic, we started looking at how that, who's being impacted by grab and go. And I will say that from the policy we've, we've drafted, our belief is that our grab and go program and any grab and go program has the potential to reach individuals who have social, emotional, psychological, physical, or cultural barriers that prevent them from attending congregate. And so, um, I'll just give a quick example that uh, in a senior center I worked at um, several years ago um, when it was congregate or home delivered, this individual was paralyzed on half of his body. And because of that, uh, he would food would fall out of his mouth. However, he was able to get out of the house. He was able to take care of himself. He could do everything else that prevented him from being by definition eligible for home delivered meal service. He just wasn't socially comfortable due to a physical disability attending congregate dining. Unfortunately, because of policy at the time, we told him that his choice was congregate or bust. Um, so now in hindsight, looking back at the value of grab and go, he was asking for that. He said, can I just pick up my meal and take it home? Um, so I, I reflect back on that as kind of, that is the individual that we're trying to reach. We're trying to reach those folks who, maybe don't speak fluent English. And in my community, English is the prominent language that's spoken. And do you really want to engage with people that you can't communicate with? We have an obligation to find other ways to connect with them. Um, but in the meantime, we need to serve them where they're at. Um, and I will just say that in addition to, um, so, so in addition to the people that we served, that haven't come elsewhere just for, I'm a statistics person, that's approximately 10% of our overall market reach in any given year. So what that means is that we served uh, in this last 12 month period, about 1600 individuals um, in any myriad of ways. But had we not had grab and go, we would have lost 10% of that market reach. Um, so when we're thinking about reaching those isolated folks, I think this is one of those areas where our shift needs to happen and we need to really get beyond the bureaucratic, for lack of a better phrase, policy of what has always been and start looking at what is our mission and how do we fulfill it in a meaningful way. Uh, so thank you for the time. Um, and I look forward to hearing the others. Thank you, Mike. And yes, I think this the issue of, of trying to continue thinking about how do we reach people who we aren't already reaching is a topic that I think many of us could spend a lot of time um, discussing. So I appreciate your, your sharing. Um, and I'm going to move over to hear from Elaine. Hi, I'm Elaine Barlis um, from JP at Home. And uh, I was thinking about what Michael just said, that there has to be a shift from if you don't like it, don't eat it. Um, and I think um, JP at Home and other villages uh, represent that shift, provide that shift because we are member-driven organizations. Uh, JP at Home, which by the way is written JP at Home, not Jamaica Plain at Home, um, is a member of the village movement and we're part of Ethos, which is a not-for-profit organization that promotes independence, dignity, and well-being of elder adults and the disabled. Uh, while JP at Home began in JP, we and therefore the name, we also um, are include several neighborhoods that are adjacent uh, to ours. Uh, so I said we're part of the village movement. So what's a village? First of all, I want to make it clear it is not to be confused with the villages in Florida. There is absolutely no relationship. Um, it is a grassroots neighborhood-based membership organization that supports older adults aging in place. Um, another way of saying that is we are an organization of members. We do the planning, we do the programming, we make things happen. Um, the village movement itself, because there are many other villages, began in Beacon Hill in 2002. And there are now over 400 villages internationally. And I think it's about 250, between 250 or 300 in the US. Um, so as I said, since we are a village, um, like other villages, we're neighborhood centered, we're bottom up, um, and we provide programs and member to member assistance. Um, in essence, 
we provide the kind of organization, the kinds of opportunities um, that so positively affected Mark Freeman's grandmother. And that I think uh, to Colleen McGuire, we would serve your needs. We have lots of people who have uh, made that shift from a working life where you have a work family and work, work friends uh, to being able to find people in your own community that uh, you want to be acquaintances with, you want to see in your local shopping area, or that you actually develop some very deep friendships with. Um, JP at Home has some of these significant strengths uh, for addressing loneliness and isolation because we're trusted by our members and by people who uh, are thinking about joining because we are neighbors. We're all in the same community. Um, our activities all derive from peer-to-peer -peer relationships. The activities are all created by members. Uh, most group activities are small and our new activities are proposed and implemented um, by our members, as I was saying earlier. So they not only reflect the interests of an older population, but they also result in members taking ownership of the activities because they've created them. Um, so I'm gonna give you two small examples of our programs. Um, these, like all of our programs, affirm members' lives by demonstrating their lives have value and of interest to others. And they lead members to develop emotional connections with one another in the course of um, the activities through these programs. So the first one I'm gonna tell you about is uh, called Tell Me a Story. And uh, no surprises there. One or more members share a story. Um, there are no content rules. Uh, there's nothing that either is, has to be on the table or off the table. Participants can tell a story about anything they want. It can be a brief anecdote. It can be a longer story. Um, they are heartfelt, they're sad, they're funny. Um, very often the storyteller is telling the story about themselves or it may be about another person. But in that event, usually that person has had some kind of um, major impact on their lives. Um, and these stories are about people's own lives. Maybe it's a childhood memory, maybe it's falling in love. Maybe it's times of loss and loneliness. Um, in doing so, the storyteller opens themselves to the group members and the group members are opened by hearing those stories. Um, after the story is told, the participants get to comment on the story if they want to. Often they're sharing similar experiences and relating and building that sense of, um, of trust and relationship. And in the process of this storytelling, both the storyteller's life is affirmed as having value um, and the process creates stronger connections among the participants. So it's a very simple idea, but it is very, very powerful. Um, another one I wanna talk about, the second program, um, which also ultimately devolves on this creating relationship, creating connections, um, is called Pass the Apron. Again, not a big surprise. It is the JP at home version of a TV cooking show. Um, members volunteer to demonstrate a recipe on Zoom. So for each um, month, there's a month, more or less monthly program. There's a member chef, who's the cooking volunteer, um, a member MC, who asks questions, makes comments, makes sure the program is moving along at the proper pace, um, and a member who acts as the uh, camera person who follows the guest chef along and to what they're making, what their actions are using, uh, you know, simply the, uh, um, the video from a, a uh, laptop. Uh, while the chef is demonstrating the recipe, they get to share stories and memories about that food and why they've chosen that recipe. Often these are stories of 
uh, members' own childhoods and having a recipe be particularly evocative of somebody who's important in their lives or a place that they grew up um, as they're preparing this, re this recipe. Um, so even though it's on Zoom, it feels very uh, tactile. Um, and members get to um, ask some questions by chat. So again, this provides a pathway to reaching out and creating personal questions um, with the participants, our members, or we also have people who are thinking about becoming members who come to our programs. Um, those are just two of JP at Home's many programs. Um, we're always creating new ones because somebody always has a good idea. And um, once you ask people if along with the good idea, they're prepared to uh, help create the program, even with the dropouts after that question, we, we get a lot of new programming frequently. So all of these programs and the relationships that develop, which are, you know, continue many of those uh, relationships go on outside JP at home as well as inside, um, provide means of engaging elder adults, including isolated older adults, um, because each group's theme, each group's purpose is developed by people like themselves. It's developed within the organization. The groups are small and low threat. It's easy to join one. It's easy to get to know people within one. It would be very hard for somebody to show up to a meeting at JP at home and want to leave because they feel like they don't know anybody because they're, their groups are small and everybody reaches out. Um, the groups are run by members, so there's no top-down um, effect. The groups provide an environment conducive to making friends, as I said, and as I demonstrated with these uh, two programs, affirm members' life experiences and offer support to one another as we age in place. So I'm gonna end with a shameless plug. Um, we have our own niche in the community in which we all work and are trying to provide meaningful services. So as a small, local grassroots neighbor to neighbor organization, your local village, because there are villages all over Massachusetts, uh, can complement the support your organization provides to your clients. Um, so when you're thinking about your programming, when you're thinking about what you need to provide to um, your clients uh, to follow Michael's lead, um, think about find out about your local village and think about them being part of the bundle of services that you're providing, a way for your clients to get rooted within the local community, be, create, create connections with their neighbors, people who live nearby, people who are seen at the same supermarket. Um, because our small neighbor, neighbor to neighbor approach could be that missing piece in what you want to offer and that we can partner with together. So thanks very much. Thank you, Elaine. And it looks like there's a link to the Village to Village Network in the chat for those who want to learn more. Um, we have about 10 minutes where we have the opportunity to ask questions or um, make comments to discuss with the panelists. Um, you're welcome to put those questions or thoughts in the chat. Um, is probably the best way to get them to me. I, I, I'll start. I have a question for the folks on the panel. I think all of the examples that you offered um, really speak to the adaptability, the innovation, and frankly, the personalization of a lot of the, the programs and services that you are all um, administering. My question is about when you think about folks who you aren't reaching in your community, um, how, what kind of strategies or ideas are you um, thinking about uh, considering when it comes to reaching those who aren't already being reached? Um, so it's really a question for all of you. I don't know if anyone has any uh, thoughts on that, um, but I think it would be interesting. One of our goals for the coming year and as a task force is to really continue thinking about that. How do we reach those who are still isolated in, in their community? Um, and so wondering if any of you have any thoughts or ideas about that. Jean has her hand up. 
Um, so we all know that we run this thing called the Meals on Wheels program, where we deliver uh, meals to the homebound. Um, what I've been doing recently is partnering with organizations like the Lions uh, Club um, or our knitting group or our quilting group, and we make small little um, objects um, and, and let them know we're thinking about them. And um, we put a little card that goes with it. Um, we've had high school kids make holiday cards that go out uh, to them. Uh, letting them know that they're part of a broader community, they're part of the fabric of the community, and they're not alone. Um, in the olden days, when uh, before COVID, persons delivering the meals would go in, you know, have a conversation, uh, even get some ideas about what's in their refrigerator and feed that back to the social services network at the COA. Because of COVID, we can't have that anymore. But this connection through sending them something, letting them know that we care deeply um, is something that we've been building on. Great, thank you. Uh, Janet? Oh, on mute. Storytelling in terms of um, local neighborhood newspapers, we're not doing enough of that because that takes time. But you know, when we do it, it's, you can, you know, sometimes you can advertise, but rather than advertising is if you can get a story, I think not all older adults, but sometimes they're dropped off at buildings, they're dropped off at places, the local, the, the JP Gazette, the, the Alston Brighton, the Duxbury, whatever, um, people will often read that when they don't read the big news and paper stuff that people do so that they know about it. Also, maybe the Human Service Network. I know that recently I took somebody to a medical escort appointment. He had been waiting eight months. He was asked to do an endoscopy and colonoscopy, and he couldn't do it because he didn't have any. The healthcare system is such you cannot get an appointment unless you have somebody to take you home. And many, many people don't. So he his cancer could have grown. He could have been like but it took him eight months. He had no one to take him, asked one person they couldn't. And finally, a social worker told him about Friendship Works. And I actually was very blessed to have the opportunity. I actually only had to walk him home from Mass General Hospital. That's how close he was, but he was not allowed to have that appointment. It took him eight to 10 months to get it until he found somebody who would take him home. Um, thank goodness it all turned out good, but his cancer could have grown during that time. But it was like, how to, you know, how to get the social work network that people might be connected with um, or the community to know about your program so they can refer people or let people know maybe you'd like to join the council on aging, maybe you'd like to do this. So word of mouth often um, works best. Joanne? So I would say getting out in the community. So we partner with the library and offer programs at the library as one location in town, because um, I'm sure you've all heard, I'm not old enough to go to the senior center yet. Um, so that's one thing that we're trying to meet people where they are. The other thing that we're doing is we're finding food insecurity. Um, so we're working with South Shore Community Action Council that's down in our area, and we're bringing food to senior housing. So we'll do a bag lunch. They'll provide a little a frozen soup, we'll get a roll and make a cookie and give them a bag lunch. Um, it's just being out there meeting people where they are because they may not be able to get where we are. So our, our goal is really that, you know, not everyone's comfortable coming to the senior center for one reason or another. So we need to go where they are comfortable. Yep. Uh, Mike? Uh, just very quickly, um, I would say uh, to, to kind of tie into what the three previous speaker said is PSAs and storytelling. And I would do that. I, I have a vision to do that directly through our community public access program. Um, in relation to my program with the grab and go, I actually envision having them drive up to the camera, tell us why the program is beneficial to them and then drive off. So people not only get to hear the benefit of the program, but they get to see exactly how easy it is and how unobtrusive it is so that whether it's because you don't want to step foot in the senior center, to Joanne's point, because you're too young, or it's because you still have COVID concerns, you can see what that relationship is to the senior center and how it might work for you. Yeah, I think that's a great a great idea and, and ties into what the other panelists have said. I, the other thing I think about, and, and Jean, um, you mentioned sort of a knitting group, and I 
I'm wondering about, you know, are there ways to engage homebound older adults who are volunteering to produce some of that knitting or to produce writing letters or writing cards and really um, putting the the sense of purpose and the sense of helping on on the the, fir- the person who may usually f- find themselves in the case of receiving um, those things. I think that can be a powerful way to engage people's sort of self-esteem and self-worth. Um, and I see uh, Cynthia in the chat is talking about when they have um, sort of tech focused opportunities that they're seeing more men participate in those programs. And so that I know uh, an area where um, we're trying to many folks are thinking about how do we engage people of um, all genders. Uh, Janet and, and then Jean. Yeah, just one one more idea that I, um, because of the intergenerational focus of our keynote and so forth is, I mean, many people have no one literally and they don't, and they don't have that relationship with a younger person, some older adults, but many do and they're, they're not feeling comfortable reaching out. So getting our messages out to the younger People who will then tell their aunt, their grandparent, their neighbor about, hey, I know you don't get out, but here's this program and, you know, let them know about it again, talking about both media, but but word of mouth. So the more we can tell different generations about the work that we're doing in the field of aging, the more it becomes a community and the more um, people will know about it. Yeah. Uh, Jean? Um, some of us uh, run what are called formal companion programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we train and screen uh, companions, uh, they're Cori checked, uh, they, and they go in the home to provide um, not only connectivity and companionship, but they also may make a light meal, they may take somebody to a medical appointment. Um, some of ha- us have contracts with ASAPs. Uh, so the cost of these things are heavily subsidized, uh, but, but you could go in for a two hour period and you take that person or you help that person. But largely it is about c- connectivity and many of them take them out for meals and things like that. So, so, so some of us are running formal companion programs. Great, uh, Elaine? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about this issue of uh, engaging men, which can be harder, and the comment about uh, tech. We have a, we JP at home have a group called Teach Tech to Me, and it is taught by uh, members of JP at home, as are all our groups, and brings in other people in the organization so that we, we attract a number of men because they want to teach and share what they know and then they're able to share that that knowledge with other members. The other thing is we have something that's simply called the men's group because we were finding that even where there were many members who were couples that the women were showing up to things and the men never did. So a couple of the men decided to start the men's group and it has been extremely long run. It meets every other week. Originally, they started at once a month, and then they decided, no, that wasn't enough. Um, then they decided to make a, a lunch meeting, and now they all bring lunch and have lunch. And um, it's very well attended, and people are very connected to it. So sometimes something just as simple as that, which has no subject matter, um, can bring men in and give them a place where they can relate in an environment that feels comfortable and safe to them. I think that's a great point, uh, Elaine. And I think it also, aside from the the men, the the men piece, I think it's also an example of sometimes people just want a, an op- an opportunity to sort of freely so, uh, socialize uh, with others without sort of a formal agenda or program. Um, just not you know sort of cafe style. You know, you meet up for a cup yeah. of coffee and have a nice conversation. And sometimes that's what people are really looking for. And I, I think sometimes we, tr- we overcomplicate it um, by trying to program everything. Um, so that's a great opportunity, um, great thing to think about. And so um, uh, Joanne has something to say, and then we're gonna close out and move along. So the other thing in regards to getting men is people really wanna be outside. Yeah. Um, and we have started a bocce group in Cornhole and it's pretty casual, people just come, but it's getting people together outside and more men are participating and taking the lead, which has really been wonderful. Yep, that's a great example. Jean? 
I, I think one of the things that um, I have really, really enjoyed listening to, to the group is the fact that everybody at a time of uncertainty have been taking great risks. You know, uh, they've been saying that I'm not part of the wait and watch. We've got to tackle this thing and we will be a pace setter. And so as I was listening to my colleagues, I've been so proud of the, how they have grown through the pain and everybody has just uh, built a lot of resilience and said, you know, we've got to tackle this topic and we're gonna tackle it in unique ways mm -hmm. and together we're gonna move forward. So I was grateful to listen and learn from each of them. That's a wonderful observation, Jean, absolutely. Uh, no one in this room is uh, members of the the wait and watch um, category. So thank you all for your time and your sharing this afternoon. And I'm going to pass it over, I believe, to Casley. Wonderful. Thank you so much. What a interesting conversation and very inspiring. Uh, so I am going to get my slides up here. And then we will get started. All right, so my name is Casley Killam. I'm the founder of Social Health Labs, and I joined the task force back in 2020 when I was studying solutions for loneliness through the lens of public health in Boston, and I now chair the task force's public awareness committee. So over the next few minutes, I am going to give a brief overview of the task force and the work that we do. I know that some of you are very familiar with our work and may be a member of the task force, but many of you are learning about this for the first time. So we wanted to share more insight. I'm gonna highlight some of our key initiatives and then share a few ways that you can get involved. And that's true whether you run an organization that works in, in this space or if you are simply a community member, a neighbor, a local resident who's looking for a way to volunteer and get engaged in this, uh, in this topic. So first let's talk a little bit broadly about what the task force is. So the task force to, uh, to end loneliness and build community is a statewide coalition dedicated to ensuring that all residents in the Commonwealth feel connected to the community and enjoy a strong sense of social well-being. Our initiatives and advocacy, uh, we've been lucky to be featured locally in the Boston Globe, as well as nationally in the New York Times, Health Affairs, Psychology Today, and others. So since launching in 2019, we have grown to over 75 members representing more than 40 organizations across the state, some of which you see here. These include state and city level government, nonprofits, academic institutions, advocacy groups, startups, and other partners. And all of these partners are truly inspiring. They're incredible, the work that they are doing and have been doing for many years. And really our task force is meant to convene and bring together all these groups um, to really help amplify their ingenuity and leadership in our communities. So why did we come together uh, in this way? Well, we formed in response to uh, the public health issue of social isolation and loneliness that we've been discussing today, which unfortunately was widespread long before the pandemic, um, although certainly that brought it to the forefront in, in a new way. Here in Massachusetts, over 500,000 residents over the age of 50 live alone and therefore are at a higher risk of experiencing loneliness. And of course, as we've discussed, we know that people of all ages experience uh, loneliness. So task force co-chairs Sandra and Caitlin knew from their work at AARP Massachusetts, as well as the University of Massachusetts, Boston, respectively, that communities were seeking solutions. And we heard that from many, from many of the founding members. Um, so we really formed the task force to convene people around that need. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe we were actually the first official statewide coalition dedicated to this issue in the United States. So let's talk about some of the key initiatives that we've been focused on over the years. Early on, our work was focused on really listening and learning to understand how social isolation and loneliness were showing up and being experienced by residents and really to identify different local needs and opportunities. So we hosted a series of regional conversations with hundreds of community leaders and residents and then translated those needs into specific focus areas. So those included addressing the lack of awareness about this issue among kind of lay people and, and general residents, 
bridging the digital divide, fostering multi-generational connection, and engaging older adults as partners in this work. We've been meeting every single month um, since 2019 uh, to pursue this work together. We synthesized the insights um, and ideas that came out of those early conversations into several reports, um, which you can download on our website, including It's the Little Things that offers a lot of different recommendations. And then we also launched exactly two years ago on Good Neighbor Day in 2020, the Reach Out MA campaign. The intention of this was to really promote the health benefits of connection, the health risks of isolation and loneliness, and share actionable tips for residents to reach out and connect in their communities. And the campaign featured different mayors and uh, other community leaders in a series of PSAs that were shown on television as well as on social media. Building on that work more recently, um, we recently launched a television series, which we're very excited about, that explores different themes related to healthy, connected aging. A lot of studies have shown that most older adults are still traditional cable television viewers and often actually depend on those community media channels for their local news and their entertainment. So we wanted to uh, meet people where they are literally in their living rooms um, and share this important information and work with them. So as a result, um, through partnering with the Mass Media Exchange, we reach an audience of potentially hundreds of thousands of cable subscribers across the state. You can watch past episodes on our website. Um, they explore various topics that we've been exploring here today, as well as other ones such as connected caregiving, being tech savvy at all ages, and many more. We also know that um, the places, the physical places where we live, work, play, and frequent every single day influence how connected or how isolated we may feel. Um, so we're currently co-developing a pilot project with Healthy Places by Design to really activate shared spaces in different communities. Recently, our members have supported and installed happy to chat benches um, in different neighborhoods to encourage conversation among neighbors. And actually benches in Salem were recently featured um, in the Boston Globe just a couple of weeks ago. Another key focus area, as we've talked a little bit about, um, is bridging the digital divide. Of course, we know that technology access and skills are absolutely crucial to help people stay connected, whether or not there is a pandemic. Um, and to that end, our members have launched the Technology Learning Collaborative, as well as are developing uh, an evidence-based intergenerational pilot program around this issue. And finally, this has come up a lot today, but certainly one of the themes that runs through all of our work is the importance of intergenerational connection. And so since we as a task force have made up of people of all ages, and we know that this issue affects people of all ages, we think it's really important to bring this lens to our work. Um, so we help highlight different successful programs as we have today, um, as well as advance them. And truly many of our members, as you've heard from, are, have pioneered this work for many years. So with that, what are some of the ways that you can get involved if you're new to hearing about the task force and feel inspired by the conversation that we're that we've been having today? Well, the first is to join. We welcome new members. Again, whether you represent an organization or you're simply a community member who's interested in this work, if you have an idea for a collaboration or just want to get involved in any of the initiatives that I mentioned, please reach out. You can leave your name and email in the chat or you can contact us on our website um, after today. A second way to get involved is to share your ideas. And many of you have been in the chat today, which has been wonderful. We really value your input, expertise, and lived experiences. The whole purpose of this task force is to serve the community and to bring everyone together around this topic. Um, so if you are an older adult, for example, um, you might consider joining our Valued Voices Committee, which is an, essentially an advocacy group for, or sorry, an advisory group for the task force that weighs in and gives input on our initiatives and helps support our partners. We also welcome guest authors to write on our blog if that's of interest. Um, and just in general, if you are a community organization not already affiliated with the task force, 
um, we, we would love to hear from you and understand what challenges you're facing in the community and think about ways that we might all support each other in that. And finally, the last way to get involved is certainly to spread the word. We've created a number of different resources that I mentioned, including the reports, including the TV series, uh, including the Reach Out MA campaign. So please consider sharing each of those um, with a friend, with a neighbor, with a coworker. Um, and you can find all of those on our website at endlonelinessma.com. So with that, we hope that many of you will, will get involved in these efforts moving forward. And thank you. I'll hand it back over to Caitlin and to Sandra. Thank you, Kathleen. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, special thanks to Senator Jalen, to Mark Freeman, and to our panelists. I want to give special thanks to all our task force members who give so much of their time and to everyone who inspires us to do this work. As we move to 2023, our goal is to continue sharing strategies that are working in our communities, to take a deeper dive into addressing issues and providing solutions and ideas for caregivers and the LGBT community. It is also time that we begin to look at those systemic structures that lead to loneliness and social isolation. So we hope to promote innovative co-generational opportunities for socially connected outdoor and public spaces, for housing and transportation, all of which will widen the possibilities for keeping our residents connected. Caitlin? Thanks, Sandra. And I wanna reiterate what the, the gratitude that Sandra and I have for everyone on the task force and anyone who joined us today. It's a real honor to do this work with you all. Um, I wanted to also just mention as we look forward to the next year of the task force that we are committed to um, continuing to bring people together. Those of you who are doing the work, connecting people to people in your community, we wanna hear from you. We want you to be engaged with us. We want you to tell us about what's going on in your area um, so that we can continue to learn and share with one another. Um, we also are committed to um, uh, staying in community and staying close to community, understanding that there are those um, of us who are returning to some semblance of normal life after the pandemic, but there are also many who are not um, returning to strong social lives and strong social networks. And we want to continue thinking of ways to engage those folks who are continuing to live in isolation or experiencing loneliness. And lastly, it is also our commitment to continue um, being part of a national conversation that's happening on this topic. Uh, as as Casley mentioned, we're one of the first statewide networks to really tackle this issue and therefore have been um, connected with other states and other national organizations who are trying to push forward. And we will continue to do that so that we, those of us in Massachusetts who are working hard, um, continue to be at the forefront um, of the solution making around these, these issues. Um, and lastly, I, I wish you all a, a happy Good Neighbor Day and, and hope that you all find a way to connect uh, with the neighbor, whether that's uh, in your near your home or at your place of work. Um, just reach out and, and make someone feel connected today in celebration of this national holiday and uh, be well. Bye. Take care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.